well, let's take our Bibles and the time remaining and turn to the book of Daniel. You might say, well, why are we jumping from 2 Kings all the way to Daniel? Well, remember that at the end of 2 Kings, Nebuchadnezzar came down and destroyed Jerusalem and took a number of the what he considered to be the wise and well-favored, skilled in wisdom, into captivity, into Babylon. That's the way he worked. He liked to take the best of those nations that he conquered and put them in his government, but in essence, train them in the ways of Babylon. So the Lord purposed that Daniel should be brought into Babylon along with his three friends, their names were actually Ananias, Azarias, and Mizael, but we know them as what? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because that was the name that he gave them. He tried to convert them. And that's really the story here. The title of this message is Daniel the Prophet. And as we study through this book, we're going to see how the Lord purposed that Daniel should be established as a prophet even in that land of captivity, and that through him his word would be given. Here it says in Daniel chapter 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and besieged it. We saw that already in 2 Kings 24. If you want to just refresh and go back and read that. So that's the connection between 2 Kings and Daniel. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Now, Jehoiakim would have been the second to last king that was raised up in Israel before the Lord completely wiped them out. And we studied about Jehoiakim as well there in 2 Kings, that he was the king of Judah, and that the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. It's interesting when you go back there and study in 2 Kings 24, again, that Jehoiakim actually never was taken into captivity. When the Lord purposed that Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, removed Jehoiakim, he died soon after that, and so never was carried into captivity, but it says the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. In other words, he lived enough to see that temple destroyed, and it says with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 10, which we won't at this point, but you'll see that Shinar was the plain where Nimrod built the Tower of Babel, Babylon. So Shinar would have been a Jewish name for this particular country that we know today as Babylon, which would be modern day Iraq. That land still exists, but it says, which he carried in the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Again, some would say, well, why would God cause these vessels and pictures of Christ to fall into the hands of this idolatrous nation? Well, that's the same question Habakkuk asked. You go and read Habakkuk. How, how can God, being holy and just, take a wicked nation to punish the people of Israel? Well, the reason is because they had already corrupted these things. And so by doing this, God was demonstrating that they already had made idols out of these and polluted them. And so he would now cause that they would be taken away and put into the house of the pagan gods. So this is the introduction here of this particular book of Daniel. Daniel was probably 16 years old, about, 
when he was taken captive to Babylonia. And, and there's no specific date given, but we know that he lived throughout the entire 70 years that he was in Babylon and would have died there at about the age of 85 or 86. Imagine that he was taken out of that land and spent the rest of his life in captivity. Never to see his family again, never to see his friends, never to see his homeland again. Others returned, but there's no indication as we read through the book of Daniel that he ever returned. But what matters most in this story of Daniel and here I see a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. All the prophets, the priests, and the kings were types of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here was Daniel placed in this land of idolatry, facing all of the false worship that that land represented, and yet the Lord kept him faithful to himself, just like the Lord Jesus Christ on this earth. Men tried to pull him right and left, but it was God the Father by his spirit. And I know people say, well, he was God. So, But he had to work out that salvation as a man. And so what he endured in his earthly life, living in a land where the people were ignorant of who he was and ignorant of God himself, Yet, throughout his entire life, earthly ministry, as God purposed, he served faithfully his father. Daniel, along with his friends, as I said, we're going to see that later on. Well, it's actually down in verse 6, not too far now. Among these were of the children of Judah. There's a, again, Daniel being of the tribe of Judah type of the Lord Jesus Christ, the tribe of Judah. But along with them, Hananiah, Misael, and Azariah. So these were representative of that people as the remnant that God would preserve right along with Daniel. Some say that they found this in some of the historic documents that Ananias, Azariah, and Misael were ultimately beheaded, even though they stood during the time, remember when Nebuchadnezzar said to bow and blew the trumpet, they would not. They were thrown into the fiery furnace. And they said that if God is able to keep us, but if not, they said they would not deny the Lord. That's that faith that the Lord gives and of his children. And certainly was in Daniel, even as the same spirit was in Christ himself. So this is what I want us to consider how Daniel would have been the prophet in his day. You know, when we read a lot of these Old Testament stories, we forget about other things that may have been going on during that time. Because it seems so far away. I'm thinking about 600 before Christ, 500 before Christ. I did some checking. You, you, you've heard people say, what happened in history this day? <laughs> well, in history, you look at what else was going on in the world at this time, and yet the focus is here in Scripture. That's when they began the construction on the Acropolis in Athens, which the ruins are still there today. The Mayan civilization was actually flourishing in Mexico at this time. We, we're thinking this is all and everything's about this part of the world. This is an interesting one. This is when Aesop wrote his fables. I had to go double check that because I thought you know, part of the Greek culture, those fables, it was during that time that Daniel the prophet lived during this period. Confucius and Buddha, not that they were important, but 
All of this was going on in the world during this time. Now, there are a lot of critics that claim that certainly Daniel could not have written this because it was too precise. And this is what we're going to see. Daniel was God's prophet in that day, but he foretold, as we get on into this book, of what would take place from that time all the way down to Christ. Coming over 500 years of history that would unfold. And what Daniel prophesied would come to pass is exactly what came to pass. Doesn't surprise us because we know that the word of the Lord is true. But when you talk about how Daniel prophesied, as the Lord revealed it unto him, that after Babylon there would be the rising up of the Medes and the Persians. And after the Medes and the Persians, there would be another kingdom that would come, would be the Greek Empire. And after the Greek Empire, would be the Roman Empire. All these things are foretold. And so some question, well, it had to have been somebody that wrote this book after the fact. But there's no question that our Lord Jesus Christ, if you go over to Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. I know a lot of people relate this to the second coming of Christ at the end of time. But if you read this carefully, you'll see that the Lord was describing the period of time leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in the first century, 70 A.D., the reason I say that, it says here, and a lot of people quote, for example, verse 13, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. When he's talking about that, he's talking about those times in that first century, which would know, as he says in verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you, in verse 9, up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and he shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. The Lord is describing the first century leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem where it says, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. So many people have taken that and said, oh, that's the end time. No, Christ was describing that time leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem. Verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. And it was. When the Lord raised up Paul to go around and preach to the nations, the then world that existed, the gospel went into every nation already as a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. See, that's what trips people up when they see that. And they go, oh, well, that's going to be the end of the world. Got to keep it in its context. It's talking here about the end of that first generation, that first century. The end would come out of the destruction of Jerusalem, where God would once again, even as he had in Daniel's day, now would be the destruction of that time in Jerusalem. Why? Because Christ had already fulfilled it. When it says there in verse 15, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, so there is Christ himself calling Daniel the prophet who foretold these things. Stand in the holy place. And he says, whoso readeth, let him understand. He's talking about at that time, that holy place was in that temple that still stood up until the time that God would purpose that it would be destroyed by the Romans. You say, well, how do you know that he's talking about that first century. We'll look over in Mark chapter 13. And it says there in verse 14, when ye shall see the abomination of desolation, here it is again, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not. What he's talking about there is the Roman armies that would surround 
the city of Jerusalem and besiege it just like it was leading up to Daniel's death, standing where it ought not. In other words, the Roman Titus, the Roman governor, would actually go into that temple and violate it. Let him that readeth understand, then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. And let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, either enter therein to take anything out of his house. It's all describing those events that would lead up to the destruction of Jerusalem. And over in Luke, there again you'll find that what's described there is when you see that abomination of desolation, when you see, it says there specifically, the armies surrounding the city, then that's the time to escape. Verse 20 of Luke 21. It says that when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, well, that was in the first century, then know that the desolation thereof is not. That's what the abomination of desolation is. Just like in the Old Testament, they couldn't believe that God would actually bring an enemy, evil nation to, to destroy that temple. They didn't believe it in Christ they either. But stop and think about the desolation, the abomination. For them, the abomination was that the temple would be destroyed. But consider that the Lord Jesus Christ had already come and paid the sin debt. He was that sacrifice of which all of those Old Testament sacrifices foretold. And yet they continued on like nothing was. And that's why the Lord ultimately destroyed them. So this is why we're studying name. It's because this is the, the follow-up of the story. This is the rest of the story. Of what would take place after the Lord and taken them into captivity. Actually, this chapter here, and what it says of Daniel that we'll see more of as it goes on down, verses 3 and 4. We have more about the beginning of Daniel's life here, even though we don't know exactly the details. But we have something of his original education than we have of any of the other prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, who were all contemporaries. Daniel came a little bit later. Jeremiah would have been already of age, older generation, but nonetheless, it was during this time. And the Lord immediately began to use Daniel to instruct King Nebuchadnezzar as to who he was, the true God, the God of Daniel. So in that first year, Daniel was carried to Babylon and would have stayed there for the entire 70 years. And it says in Daniel chapter 1, in verse 21, Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Out of that at the end. Remember, Cyrus was the king of the, the Medes and the Persians that the Lord raised up and conquered Babylon. And the Lord, through that Cyrus, that wicked king, ordained that Israel would be released to go back and rebuild the temple. So all the while that this was going on, the Lord was preserving Daniel to that end, that his will be accomplished. So that's what I want us to consider as, as we get into this. Today, we won't get too far other than just this being the introduction, but it shows how God in his sovereignty and his providence uses all men and all nations for the accomplishment of his purpose. This was even something that Nebuchadnezzar would be brought to learn as we go forward. In Daniel chapter 4, for example, when the Lord brought Nebuchadnezzar down and he actually ate the 
fields as a beast, and the fowls of the air, until such time as the Lord purposed that he should be raised up. And what was the lesson he learned? In Daniel 4 and verse 35, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none, none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? So even in all this, and this is a good reminder for us, when things seem to be in turmoil, yet the Lord has his remnant. He has those that his purpose to preserve and uh, does preserve for his honor and glory's sake. So we'll see in our next message, starting with verse 3, how the Lord caused Daniel to be separated out, Daniel and his three friends, and how they would not violate themselves even under that regiment of the king to do anything contrary to what the Lord himself had declared, separated out unto God. And that, like I said, is a picture of us in the Lord Jesus Christ, but Daniel is the prophet picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was separated unto his father in all things. There were many that tried to get him to follow their traditions and even denounce who he was. Remember, they were offended that he considered himself or called himself to be the son of God, that thou being a man makest thyself to be God. And yet he would not renounce who he was because he came for that one purpose, to deliver a people. And I truly believe Daniel, during those 70 years, is a type of Christ, how the Lord used Daniel to preserve that remnant and uh, under his leadership. Lord willing, we'll look at that next time.